Hi, hello and welcome. This is the interview with Paul, the founder and architect at Northern Edge Studio in South Australia. This clip was used to put together the full-length documentary Behind Closed Doors, The Life of an Architect. If you're thinking of entering the architecture or interior profession, you've got to see it. That link is going to be up above or in the description below to check that out. But without further ado, let's get on with the interview. So my name is Paul Cooksey. I'm the architect and uh, I guess the founder of Northern Edge Studio. Founded it a while ago now. I can't remember, 12 years ago. In the last three or four years, been based here in Adelaide and slowly working up a, a nice body of work here and got a nice group of people working in the office now, so it's going well. How long have you been practicing architecture for? I graduated in 2006, so that's 14 years ago now. Lots of that time has been spent as the house dad, primary care given for my kids, so I've been doing it probably part-time for most of that time, to be honest, um, working as consultancy or doing small jobs for friends, family and other clients. Only in the last, like I said, four years, it's probably been more of a full-time gig. Even now, it's not full-time. I still do the school drop-off and pick-up and run arounds, um, you know, the working parent kind of juggle. 14 years in time, maybe five if you were counting full-time experience. Why architecture? What made you want to be an architect? Always enjoyed drawing and doing all those kind of activities at school. Quite enjoyed the science aspects of, of that. My father was an engineer and I enjoyed, really enjoyed looking at his blueprints and found them fascinating. When I finished high school, I got into, into engineering at university. I decided to take a gap year uh, before I committed to that and went and traveled around Europe, did the whole gambit there and uh, came back and after seeing all those wonderful buildings and the, the canals and Europe and uh, just thought that I probably couldn't just spend the rest of my life looking at cogs and turning moments in mechanical engineering or air conditioning units. I flipped a coin quite literally flipped a coin on the phone to the preference people and changed my preference to architecture. So there you go, that's how it happened. And uh, yeah, no, I never regretted that decision. That was kind of one of those moments of fate, I suppose. Um, it's all worked out pretty well, pretty well, so yeah. Is your destiny? Destiny's a big word, but it's, it, was, uh, it was certainly, I mean, look, you know, I, there are plenty of good career paths out there. Um, architecture suited me from the perspective of being able to work in different locations, in different areas for different people. It has a broad variety of appeal for skills and things like that. If I'd went into engineering, you're less flexible for your location. You're, sp you're usually tied down to, well, harder to, to get away from the big offices environments. It's allowed me that flexibility to raise my family and to work at the same time as maintain a career that has progressed, you know, slowly, but has progressed. I guess there's benefits to the type of work that it allows you to do, the variety of the work that it allows you to do. When you're not inside the office, what do you like to spend your time on? Do you have any hobbies <laughs> outside of architecture? Yeah, so I, um, yeah, I'm a pretty active guy, so I play a lot of sport. Um, I am a soccer coach and still play soccer football, still do that and try and get my body around the football field. Um, not quite as easy as it used to be, but <laughs> still enjoying that. So yeah, me and my family do a lot of outside activities, walks and hikes and um, those kind of things. We're a busy family, so spending time together, even in the kitchen or doing things like that is great. You know, my kids are getting to just their early teens now, so it's gonna be probably not too long distance future where they don't wanna hang out with their folks. And so we're making the most of that while we can at the moment. I do uh, enjoy reading in the past, really enjoyed literature and things like that. But now it's just kind of, you know, interesting and uh, intelligent fiction is kind of just as exciting to me as anything by philosophers or something like that. In the past that was, I enjoyed that, but um, now I find that it's nice to have a break and let your brain do something different for a while. I have always enjoyed just you know, going to a new place and wandering around and getting lost in the city. That's a, that's a guilty pleasure um, that you don't get a lot of opportunity to do as a, as a parent. But when that opportunity arises to go to see somewhere new and get lost in that space for a little bit, that's always exciting. On a scale of one to 10, how long did you think that your education and your degree prepared you for the work you're doing today? <laughs> Is an interesting question. It depends on the type of work that you're gonna do. Straight up, I'll probably say six or a seven. It prepares you to think 
is probably the biggest thing that you come away from university. It gives you a basis for being able to hold several ideas in your head, process them and come away with something that is regarded as a solution. The more you work, the, you realize that a lot of people don't have that skill. The degree teaches you that primarily almost. It gives you skills in research, software skills, and it gives you the opportunity to sort of perhaps find your find the things you enjoy about it. What it doesn't give you, everybody will say this, is real world experience. When we spoke last, I talked to you about the opportunities that other courses have for work experience. And I think that uh, architecture really should embrace that opportunity to get people into studios and understand what happens there. Because even if you're hanging around in, a, in, a, in an office space environment, you realize that there's a lot more to the profession than you're given access to at university. The other aspect of that, which is important for students, is to recognize it tempers the importance that is put on some of the things that you do at university. If you think back to year 12, the stress and pressure that sometimes it parents and teachers put on you and like going, this is the year that defines you. Yeah. And then you leave year 12 and a year or two later, nobody really cares too much about what grade you did and how well you did in physics or chemistry or maths. And if you try and remember what Boyle's Law was, unless you're actually doing a science degree. So these things suddenly become a lot less likely. Maybe that wasn't as important. And I think university is a bit like that too. Once you have an, ex an understanding of what the outside world is like, you come back to the degree and you're not quite so stressed that your presentation drawings are not absolutely 100% perfect and you're not necessarily so worried that your theory isn't completely watertight. You're much more recognizing for this for what it is and it's about an idea generation process and about putting together solid but not necessarily watertight concepts. Mm. No one's expecting you to be Luc Bouzier or Mise van der Rohe when you're 21 years old. Those people do exist, but they are rare, mm. very rare beasts. So it's much more about just trying to embrace the moment and enjoy it for what it is, mm. because it is enjoyable. There is a lot to enjoy about an architecture degree. It's a lot of freedom that you're given and a lot of vibrancy in that degree and the thoughts that come out of it uh, is really exciting. It's a wonderful thing to do, but tempering it with a sense of that this is not the end of your learning journey. <laughs> this is not uh, uh, this presentation. Yes, you spend until 3 a.m. in the morning, but this presentation is not necessarily going to define you as a person. Mm -hmm. It's not what makes your career take off one way or the other. It's going to be much more important in your first job, whether you can turn up on time every day, <laughs> you can uh, listen to instruction and follow those instructions, whether you can um, work independently, whether you can do things efficiently, whether you can be receptive to people on the phone when somebody needs you to be answering a question, being able to talk the talk with engineers and builders. Even if you don't know what it is, you just need to necessarily be there in that. And that's going to be far more valuable for an employer in the first year and a half of your employment than your necessity, your skill to uh, hand draw people in CAD. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a finicky moment, but that's the reality of an employment in the first few years of architecture is just much more about, like any job, it's just being good and willing to learn, mm -hmm. I guess. To shorten that, if you could sum up your experiences of architecture school in either one word or a couple of keywords, or perhaps one sentence, mm -hmm. how would you go about that? Invigorating, helpful, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the end of the story. Is that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. What do you think are some of the, I guess, biggest differences or similarities between you know, practicing architecture and the things you do today compared to, to studio or your degree in architecture? <laughs> There's a lot of differences. <laughs> There's a lot of differences. Mm -hmm. The differences are probably too numerous to name, but the biggest one is that absolutely you don't get the same amount of time mm -hmm. uh, to generate mm -hmm. and to work through ideas. It has to happen a bit quicker mm -hmm. in a real world scenario where your time is the thing that you're selling effectively. The similarities, if you're working in a bigger office, then the team dynamic is very similar to studio. There's an interesting you know, dynamic between creatives, which is really invigorating and that's great to harness that energy. So that's similar. Also the organization that you have to have of your own time in a studio process is similar. The output is not too dissimilar, but it would be condensed, less critical in terms of the overall presentation. The major difference is that 90 
percent of my time is spent towards the back end mm -hmm. through the detail design aspects through the construction that's much more of my time where the time I get spending designing mm -hmm. uh, is maybe a, an hour a day if I'm lucky <laughs> so yeah yeah, yeah. but you, you get the design you get that fix from designing the detail too you know figuring out how that connection works to make sure that it's going to be weatherproof or last the test of time it's going to be able to be adaptable you know you've got to be a accept that your building will break at some point and how the hell do you fix it or clean it all those small everyday items that people have to live with a building and i'm talking domestic stuff as well you've just got to take that into consideration so the detail design becomes incredibly important just about just little stuff literally like where do i put the broom and where is the ironing board it sounds so finicky. I remember my lecturer talking to me about these things and I remember rolling my eyes at the time. But that matters to clients far more, far, far more than if you're thinking that your design is a work of deconstruction or, you know, a response to some current affair. Those things matter to you and that's important because it gives you passion to drive that process forward. But it, in the end of the day, it's a rare client on a domestic scale stuff, even on probably commercial stuff, that's not what holds true to them. Mm. What holds true to them is things like sustainability, it's performance, it's longevity, it's suitability. Mm. And yes, it's beauty. It, the, uh, the, there's no necessarily ranking in that hierarchy. When you put them together, like three of them at least are about the small aspects mm. of a building when, you know, maybe the other two sort of like sit at a bit more of a higher level. Do you have any kind of like morning rituals or routines you do or do you kind of just get stuck into it straight away? <laughs> um, it would be nice to have routines. Um, <laughs> no, I think the, um, the busier we've become, the, the more routines do matter. I'll go through and make either a to-do list or you know, mental to-do list try and write it down, mm -hmm. of um, where we're at with the projects and try and sort of identify things that need to happen to move those forward, mm -hmm. make sure that when people come into the door that they have a sense of purpose. Sometimes that's that's hard to do when it's just me, mm -hmm. but the idea is that they've got something to step forward to and they've got an understanding of where they're going to go through. Mm -hmm with their work and then once you've got that and you've got everyone set up and there's everyone's feeling good then it's kind of like let's move through the day and try and tick off as many of those as I can mm -hmm. if I get 70% of them done it's a great day mm -hmm. <laughs> never get 100 <laughs> never get 100 maybe I'm setting my sights too high but you know finishing at 2.30 or 3.30 even is a is a trick to try and get 100% of my to-do list done mm -hmm. that's okay mm -hmm. it's alright <laughs> I guess then during the day, like, what do you find yourself working on the most? What are the more common activities you work on? Communication. Mm. 100% mm -hmm. is um, communication. Architecture is a profession that cannot operate outside by itself. You need engineers, clients, councils, and a whole bunch of different people. Primarily, I see my role is about communicating to these people and making sure that the process is being driven forward, one in the right way too and um, in a, a manner that makes everybody feel like they've got a sense of ownership to it mm. to some extent I mean that's primarily what my role is particularly in domestic architecture where you're dealing with clients who this may be only their first or second time you know they're not too super experienced in dealing with buildings and um, and the whole process can be fairly daunting to individuals and so there's a lot of emails phone calls and I'm communicating with the, the staff to making sure that they're feeling good and they're understanding where they're going and the intent of processes 90% of my day is communicating mm. what do you enjoy most about the work you do. What do you enjoy most about being an architect? Oh, I, <laughs> well, I guess, again, the reason, there's a few reasons I do domestic stuff primarily. It suits my personal lifestyle. If I was to romanticize it a little bit, it's about stories mm -hmm. um, and it's about journeys and it's about patterns of living, which is something that's really exciting and interesting to me personally. You give this feel to uh, clients that will say, well, look, you know, any house will work. Like you can make any house work, but in reality, what you'll find is that throughout your day, and the reason I think this is why people like to hire architects, even though they don't necessarily can articulate this, is throughout your day, you'll do dozens of different things, little movements, and some of them are uh, really positive to your life and your family and your relationships. Some of those kind of patterns are really negative, and it's little things. The TV is too loud when you're eating dinner or the, the kitchen 
is too small for two people to cook at at once or the bathroom doesn't have enough light and so you constantly have them turn on and off lights. They sound like really banal things, but if you did spend 30 years of your life constantly turning on and off a light or for shouting at your kids for not doing it, then it disrupts harmony and it, it, redu it reduces the things that make people good. So build, and, and that's just, I mean, that's just on that level. I mean, you, you can have the same thing with, you know, just the sustainability aspect of a house, you know, the fact that you don't have to feel so bad every time you turn a light switch off or that your heating is just generated by the sun or that you don't constantly have to clean the dust because you constantly have to open windows if you're living in a passive house. Those aspects of lifestyle, the fact that I can help create people's journeys and patterns of life through creating something that's a little bit more tailored to them and listening to their story and interpreting that and taking that and putting it into a built form as best I can within descriptions of budget and style and all those things that go with that. That's what I really love about what I do. That's why I like doing it. That story's aspect is about that communication. It's about not only pushing information out, it's about taking information in. And so then I guess on that flip side is what you enjoy least about <laughs> the things you do. Oh, the architecture is uh, undervalued for its skill set. That's, mm -hmm. that's a hard bar bracket to push against. Mm -hmm. In domestic architecture, you, there's, there's a lot of other competitors on the market that say that they do the same as what we do. And so it becomes a, a challenge to often you have to sell yourself, which is not as easy for architects as it is for other professions. Sometimes high expectations from people, which, you know, things outside of your control, you just have to let go of those things sometimes. Look, I'm really fortunate. I get to be in my own boss. I get to work on the projects that I enjoy, mostly. Um, no, I do. Um, and I get to work with people I enjoy working with. So I'm fortunate in that I am able to do most of the things I enjoy doing most of the time. <laughs> There's a few things I don't. Nobody loves doing, um, you know, admin mm -hmm. um, and uh, all that sort of things, but they make the world go round as well. On a scale of one to ten, with ten kind of being like a dream job, one was architecture is some living hell. How would you put it on a scale of one to ten? Oh, architecture is living hell. No, architecture is not living hell. It's been a very good job for me, very good profession for me personally, um, from a lifestyle perspective. So it would be a solid solid eight, mm. uh, maybe even a nine. Mm. I don't know if any other job would be able to do what I did. Mm. Writer, maybe? You know, it'd have to be an independent creative that I was able to travel with, do work here in different places, see different things and appreciate different things and get paid relatively okay for it. No one's going to tell you that again, doing an architecture is going to earn you millions. Mm. That's not true. But it might give you ha some degree of happiness. Mm. Might. So, and, it, and it's helped it has helped me do that mm. if I'm being honest and not necessarily just you know um, waking up early feeling a bit stressed about the day mm. no I think uh, it's been good to me so mm. eight and a half mm. well, what are some of the biggest challenges you face you don't have a lot of understanding about what running a business is about mm. coming out of your degree though that is a skill that is you kind of either got to teach yourself if you want to do it or spend a bit of money and get someone else to teach you. Other aspects of it are running us, and as I long for a long time, I did it all by myself. That's hard to do work by yourself in a silo. That's a challenge because you don't have the people to bounce ideas off. That was challenging for a long time, especially when you were relatively new to the profession and you're still trying to figure out what's the right kind of damn proof course to put into, you know, onto a basement and uh, trying to understand the technical aspects of uh, specifying a polished concrete slab with an, just doing one, with an <laughs> unbonded topping, you know, and all the issues that go with that. When you're doing that by yourself for the first time, that's incredibly daunting. I'd say it's, you gotta be okay to fail, not okay to fail because that has serious consequences, but you gotta be okay to ask, um, even if it's people outside your comfort zone you got to be okay to ask. If you could go back to when you first started, uh, what was that, 2006, did you do anything differently or do you have any advice that you give your younger self? Oh, first year student? Mm. Mm. Read more, draw more. Pick up the pencil as quickly as you can in the process and draw something. It will almost certainly suck, but it will help. Like so much, so, so much more than this endless sweating over a 
process that's inside you. I didn't read enough probably my first year. I didn't really, and then I got into it in my second year and I realized that that was what drove me forward. Yeah, first year I, I found the process of design incredibly challenging um, because it wasn't a natural process to me. To be afraid to just go in there and get an idea and put it down on paper. Yeah, it'll suck, but it's at least outside of your head. <laughs> Obviously your lecturers and your um, tutors have been there and done that so they've got advice they've got experience there for you to use that's what they're there for so you know get on that but also getting to talk to local architects in your area i was told when i was going through some of the local architects had as we may be going into something like a bit of a recession now wouldn't able to find a job straight out of uni and so one of the great pieces of advice i heard was you know if you can get on a building site and do some building that wasn't something I was able to do that much. Architecture is only good when it's built. Mm. So figure out about building something and then you understand there's a lot more to a building than just you know making it pretty. That's a really powerful thing to do if you can. Yeah, making things. So there you go. How bloody cool was that? If you haven't checked out the full length film Behind Closed Doors, The Life of an Architect, you've got to set some time aside for that because it's pretty incredible what some of these guys have to share with you, some information and resources that will be really helpful if you're thinking about studying architecture or you just want to get an insight into the profession. So if you want to check that out, you can click that button to the side here, or if you just want to go on with the next interview, check that, check out that button to the side there. Catch you there.